Hi, my name is Kyle Clarich, and I'm Vice Chair for Clinical Practice in Cardiology, Consultant in Cardiology in Rochester, Minnesota at the Mayo Clinic. And we are here today for one of our sessions, Interview with the Experts. And I'm joined by two of my colleagues, Dr. Juan Crescinello, Professor of Surgery and Chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Surgery, and Malcolm Bell, Vice Chair of Cardiology and Professor of Medicine. And we are going to take on the topic today of left main coronary artery disease, selecting the best therapy for your patient. And we're going to start out because of the new trial, of the relatively new trial, the XL trial that uh, has raised our awareness and recent guidelines that were published. And maybe I'll just start out by asking Juan, what was the XL trial? Can you give us a little summary of what kind of patients they studied and what the major outcomes were? Sure. Thank you, Kyle. Um, so the Excel trial was a prospective, a multi-center, a randomized trial that enrolled uh, around 1,900 patients with left main coronary artery disease. And those patients were randomized either to PCI or a coronary artery bypass surgery. The primary outcome was a com combined endpoint of death, a stroke, or my myocardial infarction. The trial followed patients to up to five years. And at, at five years, the primary outcome, death, a stroke, or, or myocardial infarction, was not different between coronary artery bypass surgery or percutaneous coronary intervention. Great. Thank you. Do you think that um, the population of patients within the XL trial was representative of what most of us see in day-to-day -day practice? Well, the, um, the population was, um, uh, as any uh, clinical trial was uh, strictly uh, defined, um, the, the severity of the coronary artery disease was a, what we call, or the complexity of the coronary artery disease was low or intermediate, and that was evaluated uh, by uh, the syntax score, which was overall uh, low, and that tells you that the, the severity and complexity of coronary artery disease was, uh, was, was low or, or, or intermediate. And in addition to that, there was a, a, a slow proportion of uh, diabetic patients, a low proportion of diabetic patients, around uh, 30%, who are the patients who in general had more extensive coronary artery disease and more complex coronary artery disease. And we know that those patients are the ones that uh, benefit the most uh, from, from surgical revascularization. In addition, there was a, a, the majority of the patients were, were male and there was a, 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 a low proportion of uh, female patients in the trial. And was there, do you think there was any differences between the cabbage patients and the PCI patients or percutaneous intervention patients? Well, there were some uh, ba uh, baselines uh, difference, but, uh, but one of the differences that can be impactful in terms of the outcomes was the difference in the compliance of medications in the, in the follow-up period where the, the PCI patients were, um, th there was a higher higher uh, proportion of patients who were taking antiplatelets, uh, dual antiplatelet agents, uh, agents than uh, compared to the, to the coronary artery bypass surgery patients. And what was the, or was there a time dependence uh, on the outcomes? Yeah, certainly there was a, a, a time, um, if you look at the overall result of the trial, uh, the composite endpoint of death, stroke, or, or MI, there was a, a change, a, initial benefit for, for PCI. And about a two and a half to three years, there was a, a change in the, in the outcomes where you, you could still see an increased um, increase rate of a death, a stroke, or MI on the um, PCI patients compared to to the cabbages. So after the first two and a half years, um, the initial advantage of a PCI uh, was lost. 
and that was mostly uh, related to the the increased rate of a uh, myocardial infarction and the increased rate of uh, death after that two and a half years. That's that's really interesting. So there was an initial interest or initial benefit to the PCI group, and then the curves crossed right in the middle, about two and a half years of the five years, and then there was the later time frame. There was a benefit for the cabbage patients based on uh, myocardial infarction and death, as opposed to stroke. So that's very interesting, not the composite endpoint then. What does the result uh, then tell us about our clinical practice? How does it impact? And maybe I'll ask both of us, uh, both of you to comment on uh, what your, has this changed your practice at all, the Excel trial? Um, how, do we, how do we take this into account when we're thinking about an individual patient in the office? Malcolm, maybe I'll let you go first. Thanks, Kyle. You know, I think that, it's just worth remembering that you know, when you asked about you know, the type of patients in this study, the first thing I think we need to be aware of is, is that about 15% or so were actually ACS patients. They'd had an MI in the last uh, you know, week or so. So that's a very uh, small population, but it's a, it's a population we see a lot, obviously, in the hospital practice. Uh, about 60% had stable ischemic heart disease. So, uh, this is really the group of patients that you're talking about that uh, you're discussing the uh, the findings of their angiogram uh, in the uh, in the office but i think that um, it probably hasn't changed our practice too much for you because obviously we've been doing bypass surgery on these patients for a long time but we certainly here at mayo and in other places have been doing pci for left main disease for for many years and and remember the, the original Excel uh, trial publication was back in 2016. So, uh, and that's really, I think, sort of shaped how we've approached uh, these patients along with, uh, you know, a couple of other large left main uh, trials. But I think that, uh, you know, it's important to remember that many patients were excluded from, from that trial. And so like any randomized uh, trial, you know, it's a selected uh, population. So, I think the important thing though is, and this is something that hasn't changed in our practice, uh, except for in emergencies, we, we do not do ad hoc PCI in left main disease in, in stable patients. I think it's important uh, you know, to take them off the table and, and, and have that discussion uh, with them. And then it's just a matter of uh, patient selection and we, we can go into more detail in, in, uh, in terms of that. But uh, so, as I said, I, I think it hasn't really changed that practice here too much. We've got two very effective and safe procedures, but as uh, Dr. Crestinello pointed out, it, it's the long-term outcome which is really important, and we did see those curves start to diverge. Uh, they may diverge even further uh, in 10 years' time, you know, with a 10-year follow-up. Uh, th this was a non-inferiority trial, and, and it still was non-inferior at five years, but you could see that... Uh, reversal and separation of those curves. So Juan, thank you, Malcolm. Uh, Juan, would you have anything to add to that? Has it changed the way you practice clinically? Not really. I mean, we. Um, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Bell. We, um, uh, here at Mayo, we had a, a collaborative approach in terms of uh, decision-making where we, um, uh, the, the heart team has a uh, uh, discussion about the, the, the patients and, and uh, based on the patient overall patient situation, uh, we make a decision what the, the best treatment would be. And that uh, involved considerations in terms of the complexity of the left main disease, the presence of uh, additional a coronary artery disease in, in other territories like uh, the LAD territory, the circumflex and the right coronary artery, the overall cardiac function, the presence of other uh, cardiac uh, pathologies, and uh, the, the age of the patients, the, the, the life expectancy and other comorbidities and the ability to pull the patient successfully through surgery, uh, as well as the patient's preference are all factors that we consider in that type of a decision. So then um, I'll, I'll pose this question to both of you too, is what are the um, patients that you would consider to be most benefited from coronary 
artery bypass, which left main patients would you have a tendency to, to recommend coronary artery bypass grafting versus uh, a percutaneous coronary intervention? Well, maybe as I'm not wearing the surgical hat, I think it'd be reasonable for me to uh, uh, give an honest opinion there because as Dr. Cressnell says, we, we do work in, in concert together and, and we're referring um, each other patients. Uh, and that's been a, you know, a longstanding practice uh, here at Mayo. But I think you know, when you see uh, a patient who's got an angiogram that clearly shows severe left main disease, I think the patients are best suited for surgery and the ones that you know, we would tend to sort of shy away from uh, doing PCI on would be those who have distal left main, you know, this is bifurcation, it's already more complex disease, but particularly if it's associated with multivessel disease, particularly complex uh, coronary artery disease. And, and also, you know, if we can't completely revascularize the patient, I mean, that's clearly an indication for, for surgery. And as Dr. Crescenello said, you know, the, the diabetic patients, I mean, they, these are the patients that we probably should be doing bypass surgery uh, on. I also think that all things being equal, probably the younger patients, we, we probably really have to um, perhaps have a preference for recommending bypass surgery over stenting. And one thing which we haven't discussed is, you know, the mortality difference. And, and although that was not statistically significant, um, uh, significantly different in the five-year follow-up. Uh, it did cause some controversy. It was about a 3% absolute difference, and we don't know what's going to happen uh, in the future. And, and so that younger patient, uh, I, I think they really need to be appraised of you know, the possible uh, you know, benefit in terms of needing further procedures, uh, and particularly that there might be a, a survival difference. Um, the older patient, though, um, and these are very often the patients who come along with lots of comorbidities. Uh, very often the surgeons are uh, maybe a little hesitant about you know, offering you know, open heart surgery. And if they have suitable anatomy and we can you know, offer um, complete or near complete revascularization, I think those are the ones that are better for uh, PCI. Uh, the easy ones, of course, are the ones that have osteo and shaft um, uh, you know, disease. Um, and, but again, I think this comes down to a shared decision making with the patient. Dr. Crescenero also mentioned about patient preference. And, and sometimes you have a patient that you really think probably is going to benefit from surgery, uh, but uh, and you can show them survival curves and all the data, but they're still reluctant to undergo open heart surgery. It's a small number of patients, but I think we have to make sure we accommodate uh, their um, you know, expectations and, and, and what they would like uh, to have in terms of revascularization. Uh, Dr. Crescenelli, did, did I miss out anything there? I mean, th th does that resonate with you? Absolutely. I think that uh, I agree with uh, all those uh, those um, statements. Uh, and the only thing that I will add uh, in terms of the of the young patients and and also on the diabetic patients, the the benefit, the the long term benefit of by, bypass surgery is enhanced by the use of arterial uh, revascularization. So they add in a second uh, mammary artery in addition to the lima to the LAD, that will um, have a additional advantages in terms of long term uh, long term survival. One of the things that we we learn from the uh, from uh, from from the Excel trial, and I think it's important to point out, is that um, the the mortality uh, benefit uh, of uh, surgery uh, or the survival benefit of surgery are 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 not seen until you know the two and a half years or so. That's the that's the statistical uh, when 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 the curves starts to cross and, and diverge. So if if uh, and that provides an important piece of information. If we have a patient who, for whatever reason, either because of their age or because of the comorbidities, uh, uh, the the life expectancy is going to be limited. Uh, less than two and a half years, uh, the, the the possibility of realizing the benefit from a uh, coronary artery bypass surgery are going to be very limited, and in those in those patients, uh, uh, PCI uh, will be you know uh, beneficial for them rather than surgery. Okay, 
So if I can summarize, and please feel free to correct me if, if I say anything out of line here. If I'm a non-invasive, non-surgical colleague here, but all left main uh, patients are not the same, is what I'm hearing. And that uh, since they're not the same, we would probably have a tendency to lean towards coronary artery bypass grafting in, in younger patients with a longer survival. In patients with uh, complex uh, coronary artery disease, and maybe those that are uh, have less comorbidities, but also maybe lean towards it in diabetes, even though that might be a little counterintuitive, but we've learned that from many years ago. And then the PCI patients, maybe uh, we would tend towards the percutaneous interventions and in those patients that have less lesion complexity. So, you know, the syntax score of less than 33 and increased um, comorbid uh, problems and a shorter lifespan. But in the, at the end of the day, uh, the heart team and the discussion between uh, the patient, uh, the surgeon and the cardiologist uh, interventionalists are very important. Uh, and we have to take into the consideration the patient's expectations and wishes. Um, and one last thing I think was, uh, was important to point out is that you, you mentioned the option for arterial grafts, so left internal mammary, right internal mammary, maybe even both. Um, in some of these patients. And so that's a consideration to, uh, to add to the list, even though it wasn't directly uh, necessarily uh, covered uh, in their earlier discussion. So this is great. Well, it's been great to have this conversation and I hope it helps uh, our, our listeners to better understand how we uh, think about these uh, patients with uh, what we consider to be a very serious illness and that's left main coronary artery disease. Thank you for your attention. Until next time, have a great day.